I just said I work in ethnography area. We use statistics and other kinds of observation methodologies to understand consumers. We have a website, we've seen some people talking about media, we have a website here called ccc.qbook.tv where we keep a podcast, we're on iTunes, we do a lot of things in Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, Shanghai, Beijing, places like this. We go out, collect a lot of data, make a lot of shows. And you can watch these and uh, maybe learn something from them, use it as a resource, it's all free online. You can get it through iTunes, it's podcasts and video casts and things like that. Today I'm going to go very quick with a specific example to show you. But you can go to the website and get lots of uh, more details or different subjects or different topics. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to continue that idea. I'm going to show a video, but I'm going to begin talking about the kind of research we do. We had one project we were working with a poultry company and we were really looking at the packaging down to the retail level. I usually work at retail. But to understand this, we went out to the whole channel of the poultry production, right over to the farm. And um, in, in China, in Taiwan, in Hong Kong, there's really a couple different channels for poultry. There is a factory channel and then there's a, the more uh, small scale channel. And so we went into both of these channels and took a look. And this is me making a show. But I actually worked on the farm for a month. And it was not an easy job either. So my job in the farm was to actually take the chickens after they've been slaughtered and, and eviscerated and take them to the street market. And you drive a little motorcycle with a big box on the back and the blood's coming out the back in the water. And I remember I'm taking it on there and putting them down. And the lady running the stand would yell at me. She said, And I'm holding it up. I'm like, I cannot tell which one is which. It's impossible. I don't know how you tell this. They all look the same. But we track this. We get really into it, then we track it all the way back down the channel again. And like I said, we do some small scale, some factories. Then we look at the consumption behaviors, including using the poultry in religious ceremonies, in traditional ceremonies, uh, public ceremonies like this. As everyone knows, poultry and pork are very important in many ceremonies in Chinese culture, right down to having guests in your house and your family eating it and all the different behaviors. So by doing that, we actually are able to create uh, behavioral models by going all through that. In this case, we come up with a model of uh, poultry consumption. And this model has a triangle in the center, as you can see, with two scales. The right scale is a channel preference, and the left scale is social importance. Now, on the social importance side, we have a top section, which is of high importance. That means you have something like a ceremony or some kind of a guest over to your house. As in anyone who cooks in Chinese cuisine knows, you would not buy a frozen chicken to cook a meal for your guest. On the other hand, we have retail channel, which is a unprocessed channel, low processing, which would be fresh. And the freshest chicken for Chinese consumption is just killed. You can pick the chicken and have it killed right there for you. And then high processing. And then inside the pyramid, we can break down consumers' needs in different segments. So for example, if you're eating by yourself, then someone could accept buying a frozen chicken or chicken parts, or a whole chilled chicken. Frozen chicken is a little bit extreme, chilled is a little bit better, and then as you move up the scale, you have guests or you need to do some ceremonies, then you have fresh and then fresh whole. And these are really deterministic. It's, you cannot go, for example, in Hong Kong, if you have a bye-bye ceremony on a certain day, you cannot take a frozen chicken and put it down. This is completely uh, you know, not possible. So what we get are behavioral models that are general and specific at the same time. We have a model that gives us an overall managerial feel, but then also helps us segment the market into the parts and understand individual consumers or small groups have different behaviors. So rather than just saying all Chinese consumers must have fresh chicken, which is not true, but there are times when it has to be and other times it doesn't have to be. So the way we do this kind of research, uh, this is the innovation of research, we have a kind of system we go through three big stages. First we look at some kind of phenomenon. Now this phenomenon could be something we're interested in as academics or a company comes to us and they have a specific product or a market segment. We make some observations, we go shoot video out in the field, we look at existing work from other academics. Then we break down some categories or some general rules. From there we move on to our next stage which is drill down for details. That is, we want to go down to the individual consumer level and observe their behavior. We do this through video, we can do this through hidden cameras, we can do this through participation, and then we build up more categories. 
Then we move on to a third stage, which is some statistical confirmatory testing, which we can use in our ethnography data to confirm you know, how these groups really separate. Then we need to contextualize. That is, we go back out from the individual, and we go out into the field, and we say, hey, what are people doing? What are these different groups or segments acting out? We can observe artifacts inside the environment, and we can look at things like semiotics and meanings like this. And through this, we can build up our ultimate goal is to have a model that is both general and specific at the same time. So I showed you a chicken example. I want to move on to another bigger example. So we begin with a phenomenon. And this phenomenon is one that anyone who's lived in China for a period of time knows. The phenomena, phenom, phenomenon we're going to look at today is an effect that is called often crowding or line effect. It's if you see someone in a line in Hong Kong or China or Taiwan, a line often quickly generates a very longer line. People are very interested in lines. Now, in Chinese, this has a name. It's called zhe nao. And zhe nao in, in English doesn't have a good translation because it's negative. That would be hot, noisy, crowded. But for Chinese, a place that's zhe nao is a good place to go to. Nali hen zhe nao. Neben mei onema zhe nao. So we look at this zhe nao effect, and we're going to drill down and understand it more. So how do we do this? The way we use this is we have a kind of a, a metaphor technique where we go to consumers, we give them cameras. They take the cameras in their life and take pictures throughout their day. This could be like a week or two weeks. They carry a camera around, they take pictures, they take photos. Then they bring those back for an interview. We have a very structured interview that can last up to an hour or an hour and a half. Here's an example of one of the interviews going on here. So we have multiple video cameras, and we can watch what the person's doing. All the things they say, key words, we record down and feed back to the respondent to ladder down to get to some deeper connections and meanings. They cut up their pictures. They make little collages. They make pictures. They tell us about their pictures. They tell stories. This would you know, take hours to do, and, and, and so we speed it up here to see it quickly. And you can see he, he created a very creative 3D thing. This is an example of somebody's idea of zone out. And crowded, lots of signs. I like to go there, they say. There's lots of people. But we found out, surprisingly, lots of people related zone out to being with my friends. I like, I like my doggy. He makes me feel comfortable. And somehow that's related to zone out. But zone out also is very often related to retailing. So good retailing has this uh, zone out effect. And then we take their words, you know, things like eating, and I like to go there, and it's very hot and noisy. And we put their words together, and they actually can become little stories, little connected meanings. <laughs> and you see, for example, this girl here, I like to go to the place, you have to drive there, I can call my friends to come, and when I want to go there, I really feel good. And they have, so these feelings come out, and this idea of zonao, which often in Western context, if a Western manager were to come to Taiwan, they often see the retail zonao effect, and they say, it's dirty, it's disgusting, it's noisy, it's troublesome, it's hot, get rid of it, change it, when actually that's a desired effect. So then we come up with these categories, we can find out zonao is made up of these basic five categories. Food, inexpensiveness or low price, service scape, that's very, lots of signs and uh, specials, marketing communications that draw people in and always have to have a crowd. Then we break these up into subcategories so we can see all of the little details. What happened was when we were doing this, we came up with another little finding. Let me uh, stop that for a second. And that finding is a little bit different. When we were talking to people about the zonal, they often express this idea of, you know, Sometimes zonal is good, but sometimes I get tired of it. And through these interviews, another feeling came out, another emotion came out, and so we wanted to explore that emotion. I don't have a name for it yet. I'm going to tell you a little bit later. But let's take a look. Some of their pictures they talked about, you know, I go to the hot and noisy place. I go there, there's lots of people, but I don't feel comfortable. I get tired of it after a while, and I want to have some peace and quiet. And then, amazingly, also, lots of retail stuff comes out. I go to a restaurant, and they have little cute things that make me feel good. They have a Christmas tree. I don't know if you know, but in... In many places, uh, Chinese restaurants will put up a Christmas tree in Christmas and then just leave it there the whole year. Uh, it just <laughs> doesn't matter. Because from the cultural perspective, Chinese is something that Westerners have that's good for your family. So just stick it up and leave it there. So this is, a, you know, so this is somebody's actual photo. Oh, the Christmas tree makes me feel good. It's like family, right? Um, these kinds of settings. I like to have some open space. I like to walk up these wooden stairs. I like to have a place to sit down. It's not so literal. It's kind of having pictures in your life, and then you tell a story about it. Nature came out a lot, green and grass and trees and wood, especially a lot of wood. 
So we take this and then we try to find the categories again. What are the categories of this phenomenon? And people were often talking about a kind of cycle. I go to work, I go out, I go with my boss, I have to go drinking at night, I get really tired, I go to the night market, it's really crowded and busy, I get really burned out, and then I need to recharge myself. And you know, it's related to death to some people say, oh, then I die. And other people say, then I go home and recharge, and then I feel good, and I can come out and do it all over again. So there's some kind of uh, tension between these two ideas. Zo now, which is this hot and noisy busyness, with something else. And often our respondents were talking about being in a place like this, like a tea shop with wooden tables, wooden floors, uh, uh, looking out on a garden, seeing grass and trees and things like this. So now we go and contextualize that again. And we go back out into the marketplace and we look for these places. Of course, this is an example of uh, Zonal. So we have video cameras, we go out and shoot consumers in action. And this is, a, this is an afternoon market, which in Shanghai we can find many of these morning markets, afternoon markets, or wet markets. And you can see the kind of lighting and the kind of stands they have, the kind of retail that's going on here. Lots of fresh food, lots of crowding, uh, no AC, of course, uh, very busy, lots of sales. Let's look at another location. Now, this is more the other idea. You have this format, which I think most of us would be familiar with. It's kind of a Western format. We have our, all of our little items put up very nice and neat. We have a lot more directional lighting. It kind of has that peaceful feeling about it. So this would be something that consumers relate to that kind of more peaceful feeling. Now, if we were in the West, this would be the norm, and the zona would be the unusual. In, in Asia, this is the normal. This is a Xiaobei Bai Huo. It's a, it's a chain of stores that has taken Xiaobei Bai Huo. Bai Huo, meaning department store. Xiaobei is a Xiaobei Ye Sinchang, a night market. So they take the name of a night market, change it into a store, and it looks like a night market inside. Very crowded, very tiny aisles. Lots and lots of product loaded up. Look at the people. It's always busy. It always has lines. People are stopping in on the outside all the time, and other people see that and go in. Just big flood lighting, nothing special, no special floors, no special designs, very narrow aisles. Syncopated music is always playing in the background. And then we look at another format. This is, this is in Taiwan. This would be more of that other format, that kind of peaceful feeling format. Directional lighting, the shelving is not a lot of space, but more space, and then the product numbers, the SKUs is much, much smaller. Wooden floor, nice soft music in the background. Please notice how many customers are there. Yeah, I couldn't find any. Okay, so the idea here is that the Zuo Nao is already a very well-known Chinese phenomenon. It's in the Chinese vocabulary. This other feeling, though, doesn't have a really good name, so we came up with a name for it. We call it Xian Jing, Xian Shou Xian the Xian, An Jing the Jing. It's, it's a Chinese word, but it's not really used in retailing. But I really think it fits. I want to have some of that Xian Jing feeling, right, where I just take it easy and relax. And these are the main categories. So for Zuo Nao, marketing communication, lots of signs, service scape, having a sale, having a good price, and lots of crowds. For the Shenjing feelings, the individual space, a natural service space, I also can consume things like tea or coffee and that kind of space, and it's a quiet lifestyle. So what we come up with are two main categories for retail formats, and these are core metaphors that Chinese consumers relate retailing to closely inside their life. So if you have a store and you open it and you open up on one of these emphasis, you have a better chance to succeed. If you don't understand these two emphasis, then you may have a better chance to fail. And that's the goal of this kind of research. Let me jump ahead here. We can break it down to very detailed categories, subcategories. Then we go out and we say, look, we go visit stores that fit Zonao. We go visit stores that fit the Zhenjing. And then we have hundreds of stores. And then we look at all the characteristics of those stores, the shelves, the product SKUs, the lighting, the air conditioner, the parking, the customers, how they act with each other. And we do this in our field observation. Here's an example. Can you guess if this is Zonao or Shenjing? <laughs> this is clearly a very Zonao place. Now, you have to, this is, this is not unusual Zonao. This is normal Zonao. This is a very good Zonao place. I think this is a night market. And we have the, the sales, the low price. And look here, here's a line. There's a really long line lined up for a snack. 
And what's amazing is we're in there, we're just filming around, and here comes this guy, he's walking up, he sees this line and he says, Wow, Tai Chang Ba. It's the line is too long. And then he goes right around and gets into the line. <laughs> right? So this is a typical behavior because in Chinese culture, line behavior is a form of risk reduction. And so it's a very normal that you draw other people in. It's a very, very normal behavior. Nobody would avoid the line just because it's too, too long. They just get right into the line. That's great. Here is a, here's a little, little tea shop. You can see the wood. You can see the, the wooden floor, the panels, the windows, a lot of trees on the inside. This is an excellent example of the Shenjing. This is not obviously a Zonao place. And this is called uh, Aqiu, right? <laughs> Uh, kind of a tea shop. Now uh, you see the Chinese lanterns and things like this. This place is called um, Gu Zan. It's called Gu Zan Zither. And it actually sells zither inside, but it's also a restaurant. You can go in and have uh, um, food there. They also have uh, uh, Gu Zan lessons. They also have a little place in the back where they teach Buddhist uh, lessons. And they combine it all together. And a little cat in there too. This is clearly this idea of this Shenjing kind of place, this kind of peaceful, this openness. I get my individuality back. I get I recharge myself and have that kind of feeling. So this is a very real kind of uh, normal kind of Chinese format that touches on normal core metaphors. Now you could say something like, "Hey, you know, both of these things look a little bit crazy." You know, I look at that. I look at the Zhou Nao place. Most Western managers would say that's backwards. That's the way retailing shouldn't be. We need to change it to be more up to date. Or they look at the Shenjing place and say, you know, that Shenjing, that's, that's like traditional Chinese thing. Oh, that's cute. But that's not true. Both of these are completely modern, up-to-date retail formats. They have evolved over time to match what consumers want. The problem is lots of Western managers come in and don't get that. They think everything's backwards and needs to be changed. These touch on core metaphors in people's minds that come up from the time they're born through their education. If we want to look at formats that are out of date, out-of-date formats look more like this, which we can see everywhere in Shanghai. We can see this in Hong Kong, in places in Taiwan. Now, these kinds of formats are very difficult to sustain over a period of time, but these are your out-of-date formats. This has neither the Shenjing nor the Zonao, and it's just a shop that happens to be in an old kind of channel where they push things down. So that's kind of a control group, and we can find these and compare that, and that's not going to do much for anybody. These are the ones without a future. Now we take all of that data, just hundreds and hundreds and thousands of data points, and put them in a software such as InVivo. And then we can categorize and join things together. So now we can take our field observation, our videos, with our interviews, our keywords, key concepts, ideas, photographs, put them all together and really begin to find the linkages. Then we can actually use some, some statistical analysis to find groupings and probabilities that groupings fit together or are different. We can find what are the most common attributes for certain retail formats so that if you as a manager want to enter that format, then you need to understand what are the key points you need to have and what are the things you need to stay away from to make the message clear in the consumer's mind what kind of format you have. Then we come up with the model, and this is the most exciting part. We need a model that a manager can understand, but then we can also take action at the specific level. For this Zonao and Shenjing idea, we come up with this model. And you can see it has that flow. And the flow is this idea that we got from a lot of respondents that you move from Zonao into you need some peacefulness and recharge. Then you can move back. It also represents markets. There are two separate markets here, a Zonao market and a Shenjing market. Can anybody guess in China what's the biggest market? So now is a way bigger market, way bigger. Which one do you think has the largest profit margin? Xinjiang has way bigger profit margin. So you begin to get this as a, it's an overall model, conceptual model. It includes religious references and overtones. It includes behavioral things. It's all these ideas that are wrapped up, but then it also can begin to be cut down into specific parts and pieces for market segmentation. So of course we have the overall kind of uh, Buddhist reference here. And then if we look over at the uh, marketing communication, we draw them in. It's made up of signboards, flyers, promotional layout. We have to see big signs, yellow and red especially. Service scapes, these are the ways we often have multimedia. It's very normal in uh, Shanghai even. You can see this in Taiwan. It's, com it's almost everywhere. People just open up loudspeakers, stick them on top of the retail environment, and they blast out on a, loud, uh, a bullhorn. And it doesn't bother anybody. People are attracted by it. Of course, a price, low price or special values, bargaining is often an option. Uh, 
also, this is not a negative. It's low price, you get free gifts. You also get good uh, value. People feel it's a really good value. Food is often involved. It's really difficult to not to put food together with these kinds of uh, zonal effects. Uh, zonal really includes crowds and eating with, together. So lots of people. But then you get tired of it, you get annoyed, and then you move into more of the Shenjing side, where you want to have individual feeling. You want to express yourself a little bit. You want to have authenticity, something that feels more real. So these service gates tend to be, have a cleaner air, trees and grass and wood and things like this. They also are commercial. People are always mixing up the retail side of it. And they have things like you can buy tea, you can uh, sit down and have a guzhen lesson, something like this. And then it all leads to a kind of quiet lifestyle where you can recharge and then you go back again. What's beautiful about these kinds of models from deep, thick description is that you don't just say this part of the market just does this. For example, we could say that some people are only interested in zonal, but that's not really true. Chinese consumers have a very high, complicated mixture of both. We could say something like, if you have a younger market and an older market, like under 40, over 40, probably under 40 much prefer zonal locations, over 40, 40 prefer more Shenzhen locations, but that's all relative. Uh, my zonal is level from coming from America is very low compared to what most people are used to in Shanghai. They can get in there and it's like really, really zonal. And they think it's nothing. And so the really zonal places are just impossible to even uh, in, for me to enjoy, you know. <laughs> so by doing this, we get a model that has an overall meaning. A manager can quickly grab it and look at it. And then we can cut it up and use it for market segmentation also. And that's the goal of this kind of innovative ethnography kind of research combined with some uh, statistics. So what can this do for your firm? Now this is, this is a little bit of a harder question because I'm just the researcher. I don't actually implement this. I give the results and we'll see what happens. But let me give you another example, another story I have. I set up a server a few years ago. I'm really into media and, and, and programming. And I set up a server where students, my students, could come and join a video meeting space. And I designed it this way. They had little video cameras. They put their face on there. They have a social space where many users can come in and share the space and move around and enjoy themselves. And it was supposed to be to support my classes, to help the students participate. The problem was the students never used it. This is about 2001 or 2000. It's my own server. I ran it, and students never came. So I just said, forget it. I left it alone. Then one night at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was working on a research paper. And I said, hey, I'm going to check out my video site. I go to turn it on. And I log in. I get in there. And what do I see? All these people in my video space, all looking at me, scared the crap out of me. It's like 3 in the morning. Whoa, what's going on here? They weren't my students. They're all from France. There was just a bunch of people in my video meeting space from France. The meeting space does not have a URL. It only has an IP address. And the IP address also has a flash extension to it. So how they found it? Must have been somebody purposely looking for it. So we thought, hey, this is a research opportunity. Let's study their behavior. Let's use those same methods to study the behavior inside this virtual space. So that's what we did. We went ahead and measured it. And it was really interesting to find out that the people inside this virtual space, lots of things they did were related to consumption. A lot of things about their products, the things they're doing, the things they're reading, the clothes they wear, the guitar they have. And so we came up with another category kind of classification, just like this, create another model. These are the main things that are going on here. These are the main behaviors that are going on inside this virtual space. For example, these participants like to represent their goods. They like to show the things they've bought. They often put it on their video camera and say, hey, this is the thing I just got the other day. This is something I just bought. They like to show their real self, unlike something like MySpace hiding. These people actually want to really get on there and just sit in front of the camera and show to each other. They also show their consumption, consuming goods, actually eating, smoking, or using goods that they've just bought. They also like to rule break. There's a lot of rule breaking. That is, they would you know, push people off the screen, push people away. Some guy put on some pornography once, showing that, scaring people away. They also just like to show what's going on at that moment, what they're doing at that moment. So I'm reading the book. Look, this is the book I'm reading. Through this, we can do some network analysis and see who is linked to who. Who enters the room and follows them, and then who talks to who, who's connected to who. And you see it gets quite complicated. It's really amazing. We could develop a model about who are the high users, who are the low users, and who are the bridge users. So the blue link up with the red, and the red pull the green in. The green are less active, but they get pulled in by the red people. The problem with this is, 
uh, well, the actual the advantage is we thought, hey, this is great. We have this really great model. So this ethnography came up with a great model. Now we go and we try to use the model. We try to change the space, modify the space, or bring in some commercial element to the space. Everybody leaves. Instantly just give up. They leave. Any change to the space, they just walk away. Any. Even just adding a text box or adding something that's a feature to the space, that's it, they go. So the point what I'm trying to make is your ethnography can develop really, really powerful models. But that doesn't mean you have anything the consumer wants. You see, that's, the, <laughs> that's not so easy, right? The, the model can maybe tell you, be careful, don't go there and make sure you segment the market this way. If you're going to have a retail landscape and you want to have a little bit of zone out, a little bit of changing, that's for sure bad news. But if you have a really zone out place, that doesn't guarantee that your product is one that somebody wants. And this is an example. Even we try to make some changes that are beneficial. These guys found the space by themselves. These guys joined in that space and they said, this is my space. Don't touch it, don't change it. I like it the way it is. And when you try to make it less kind of illegal feeling, they don't like it. They like that illegal feeling. They found it and they hacked into my server and they use it themselves. That's what they like. So that's kind of the conclusion. Ethnography used with these innovative techniques can be really powerful, but it doesn't create products or services for you. Thank you very much.